Worship team, thank you guys. Fantastic. Love you a lot. Well, good morning, everybody. A uh, couple things to, to think about here. Everybody loves a, to be on a winning team. I can't think of anybody who's like, ah, all we, ugh, we just keep winning. It's so frustrating, so bad, so boring. I remember uh, my two boys playing in high school football. There was a two-year period where I got to be the, uh, the high school Bible teacher as kind of a pastor to the, to the school's administration at Joy Christian High School over in Glendale. And my two boys playing football together in a season where they went undefeated. They beat teams 70 to zero. Some of the games were ridiculous. We were so stacked with incredible talents. And, you know, everybody blames the Christian schools for being able to recruit and pull from any. And, of course, it's true. You know, Jesus said, be sly as a snake, innocent as a dove. And uh, they ended up winning that state championship that year, undefeated season. And it just was remarkable for the entire school. If I go even further back, uh, back in my days, back, back in the 1900s, when I played football, basketball, and track, uh, track was my senior year. I ran the hurdles, the 400 meters, uh, a, a certain relay, and the 300 intermediate hurdles was one of my favorites. Brutal. It's a brutal to practice and get ready for running almost a full lap around the track with hurdles in front of you. And that whole year, I went undefeated right up to the state championship final run. And I happened to, and this is, when, when you grow up in Kansas, uh, 3A school, my high school had a total of 200 students in it, and uh, 40 in my graduating class, and let's just say it like it is, it's mostly white throughout the Midwest and all these. So here I am at the state finals, and I've been undefeated, it's, it's a spectacular time, I've, I've set some records and it's fun, and, and I see in one of the first heats before we get to the finals, there's this African-American guy, and I mean, he's blowing everybody out of the water, and sure enough, he and I, we get to that very final race, and he's right next to me, and I just am like, I think I can get this guy. He's going to beat me off the, the starting blocks, and then by the end, hopefully, I can catch him. Well, the story of this guy is he came out of a 6A school, and this is back in the 1900s. They didn't have the rules that if you transfer schools, you had to sit out for a little while. So this guy was in a 6A large, it was out of Salina High School, and he, his parents moved into a 3A small school, and they allowed him to go ahead and compete in that 3A tournament, and I mean, he smoked us all by like 20 yards in a 300. That's a lot. This guy was fast, but I can still say, I'm, I was the fastest white guy in the 3A Kansas State track tournament, and so anyway, it's a blast to be on a winning team. You and I both know that. We would totally agree with it. There's something forceful about it. There's something just dynamic about it, and, and it's got to be guarded. You can get arrogant with it. Well, stand with me. Jesus says one statement today. It's just one sentence as we're in this Don't Tread on Me series, and we're looking at four different passages where Jesus gave us some specific commands. And so uh, give me a second here. I was talking and didn't have this set up correct, of course. I think I can do this. Here it is, Luke 16, 16. Until John the Baptist, all right, think of that. Until John the Baptist, Jesus is saying this. It says, the law of Moses and the message of the prophets were your guides. But now, he says, the good news of the kingdom of God, that's the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. But now the good news of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone is eager to get in it. Now, that's kind of, that's the New Living Translation. It's kind of a light uh, translation. Let's get to the legit one first, but let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you. Lord, would you help us today to recognize how we are on the winning team, how we are in championship status as Christians, as followers of you. You are the champion of champions. You are the ultimate winner. You have completely defeated the craziest, most dangerous opponent in the entire world, death, sin, 
And so thank you that we are winners. May we live accordingly. Help us learn a couple things today, God, that are honoring to you above all. And when we walk out into the world, may we represent you, the ultimate champion. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. I looked up the original language of this passage that we just stood and read. And I'd like to read it to you uh, as is. And I'm still trying to get my computer to work perfectly for me here. One more moment. I'm just going to pause and get it done so I don't be so distract, get so distracted. Boom. There we go. Here's, listen to this exact translation. It might be on the screen. Yeah, it is. The law, let me go back and read it. Until John the Baptist, the law of Moses and the messages of the prophets were your guides. But now the good news of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone is eager to get in. The actual translation, if you ever want to use this, you can just go right to, to any internet browser that you want and go to scriptureforall.org. Scripture, the number four, all.org. And it'll give you the exact Greek translation. It'll put the Greek words in front of you. It'll look just like Greek. And right below it will be your English perfect translation. This is how it reads in its perfect translation. The law and the before Averers, which means prophets, translated prophets, the law and the before Averers, prophets, till John from the kingdom of God is being well messagized, preached, and everyone into her is being forced. We're talking about championship here. Everyone into her, the church, is being forced. This creates a dilemma for theologians. If I say this a lot. Can you imagine theologians or Christians arguing amongst one another? It's really shocking that that would ever happen, right? There's three options in how this passage can be translated. What does it mean? The kingdom of heaven is... There's another time Jesus in a different gospel, it's recorded just a little differently, says the kingdom of heaven is advancing and, and it's forceful and it's, people are forced into it kind of thing. And you can see in the original translation where that comes from. One of the options of what it means amongst the arguers is that, number one, it could be the, the legalistic Pharisees of Jesus' day. They were rigorously trying to force their laws upon the church and violently attacked people who didn't follow their rules. Spiritual abuse and brute force rule this kind of mentality. And there's a Bible passage that might maybe back that idea up a little bit. When Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be their king, it says, he slipped away into the hills by themselves. Is that maybe part of what that passage reads? That's the first thing. Just the Pharisees and their legalistic dominance were forcing people and violently attacking the church. And that's not really what that original language It says forcefully forced into the church, not attacking the church. So I don't agree with number one. I don't agree with number two, but some say it could be this, that unchurched people were forcing and attacking the church and in the form of abuse. They were abusing the church in every generation. Uh, female abuse is driven by a lack of respect. This is where we get the term rape. It's where we get the term power and, and dominance and some abuse issues. So uh, the church is considered the bride of Christ People were being forced into her, and some theologians say that it was just unchurched people not respecting the church, taking advantage of it, abusing it, and causing the church to become benign, if I can use that term. Think on that for a second. When the church becomes benign, it stalls into a state of being isolated from its surrounding culture, from its surrounding environment no longer affecting or being affected by those external forces, and she becomes a sitting duck that's easy to be attacked, or it becomes a closed system that dies. If I had to pick, I would rank that one. Maybe you could, you could convince me that's what Jesus meant in that passage we stood and read. And, and the same word for that kind of force is the same word used in Matthew 16, 18. Soon, a gale of wind swept down upon them when they were in the boat, and the sea grew very rough. And that same word, forced upon, is the same word used in that Matthew 16 passage. Swept down upon them. We're talking power here. So if it, in my opinion, and you can disagree with me, we'll both argue about it in heaven, it's not option one, it's not option two. What about option three? That it is simply a violent decision. 
It's a violent decision that a person must make, that you must make, to enter the kingdom of the living God. And people are forced into her, it says. It's a violent decision to say, I want to become a follower of Jesus. It's supposed to be a very obvious decision that absolutely changes our lives and it becomes evident to people around us, in, but, but not in all the weird ways, wacko ways, that too many people under the umbrella of Christ seem to display. There's got to be a way, never forget this, that Jesus had, a, he had an aggressiveness about him, something extremely uh, dramatic and attractive, dynamite, if you will to the unchurched world. And in Jesus' day, those who were far from him, they flocked to him. They ran to him. They they just couldn't help it. They wanted to be around him. And the church people ran from him, hated him, ended up crucifying him. It's opposite today. It's been reversed. Church people flocked to Jesus, and unchurched people, people who are far from him, they don't want to have anything to do with him. But the Bible tells us that Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. So who's changed? And I say that all under the umbrella. When we become followers of Jesus, it is a violent decision. It violently changes our lives, and it's supposed to. But in such a dramatic way that somehow still the people who do not know or do not believe in Jesus, they're still attracted to him. So we don't become a wacko or a weirdo under the name of Christ. We're normal people who are dynamite, who are savvy, who are creative, who are joyful. All of those things are the qualities of a championship person, a championship team that everybody wants to be on. So it's a violent decision. Listen to this passage, Luke 13, 24. Work hard, there's violence in that, to enter the narrow door to God's kingdom. For many will try to enter it, but will fail. How about Luke 14? A large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, if you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else, your father, your mother, your wife, or your children, your brothers or your sisters, yes, even your own life. It's a violent decision to become a fully devoted follower of Jesus. And he says, if you don't, otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you don't carry your own cross and follow me, you can't be my disciple. That simply means every single one of us have something in our lives that we want to hold on to, that we want to be, the way we want to live, and it's your cross. And Jesus says, I'm not taking that temptation away from you. I'm not going to make it any easier for you. You got to pick up your cross. You got to follow me. It's a violent decision to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus, and there is a lot at stake. And it's a fascinating thing to me how people play around with eternity. Heaven and hell are at stake, and eternity is forever. And it's not a fear thing. It's a reality thing. Listen to Matthew 16, 18. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the powers of hell will not conquer it. Hell can be translated in different ways. That's why that G is still there if it is. Yeah. And the powers of hell will not conquer it. What's the passage we stood and read? Violence storming into it, aggressive, forcing themselves into the church. Have you forced yourself into the kingdom of heaven? And it's obvious to everybody around you. Those who go to heaven must take pains and strive against the stream of popularity and press against the crowd that's going the other way. This is not a cheap and easy faith. And for the first time in all of world history, in Jesus' day, this is pretty cool, tax collectors, sinners, prostitutes, if we get details, are storming their way into the gates of heaven. How do you treat the lowly? How do you treat those who are outcast? How do you treat those that are considered the worst of worst in society? Jesus welcomed them and told them they would be first to enter the kingdom of heaven. He broke all the rules, and it was a violent decision that caused violence against him. The gospel, here's the thing, the good news of Jesus, the church, it thrives under violence. It makes a better headway against a world that fights it than against a world that just trifles with it and plays around with Christianity, is comfortable with Christianity. Bitter hostility is better than half-hearted devotion. The church thrives where there is bitter hostility. It always has from its very beginning. 
So follow my thought here. Many Christians, they believe that it is essential that Jesus placed upon us as his followers, as Christians, that we're called to be nice. It's a fascinating concept. These Christians are wrong. Nowhere in Scripture are you called to be nice. Jesus has not called us to be nice. Rather, He has commanded us to be good. He's commanded us to be righteous. It's different than being nice. How? The difference is this. Nice people never confront evil. Good people do. Nice people have a tendency, when you really study it, to be weak. Good people... Righteous people are strong. Jesus isn't nice. He's kind. It's different. He's compassionate. That's different. He's caring. It's different than being nice. But more important is that He is unbending. He is unflinching when it comes to standing for the truth. And it cost Him His life. It's a violent decision. I'd like to read some things for us this morning. Just tune in. We've got plenty of time. Sit back. Are you as a Christian, are you on the championship team? Are we winning as Christianity? In American culture, I don't know if you watch the news at all or if you hear the tone out there, a lot of people think Christianity is on the losing end. It's in a downward cycle trend. Churches all around the world and across the the country by the thousands are closing their doors uh, every month. Does that mean Christianity is on a down streak or does it mean something else? Listen to some stats here. You know where the fastest growing church, Christian church in the world is right now? It's spreading like wildfire. The country, just think for yourself for a minute, don't shout out answers. What country might you pick? The answer is Iran. Listen to this article. Large numbers of Iranian Muslims are walking away from Islam and toward Christianity. According to the Frontier Alliance International Studios, uh, they have a movie out called Sheep Among Wolves, Volume 2. It's a documentary inside of Iran. A country, here's a quote, a country where the majority of citizens are Muslim. The fastest growing church in the world is blossoming underground in Iran. One identified, unidentified Iranian church leader, he went so far as to say, Islam is dead in Iran. It's fascinating. The church leader who remained anonymous for his own protection asked, what if I told you Islam is dead? What if I told you the mosques are empty inside of Iran? What if I told you no one follows Islam inside of Iran? Would you believe me? This is exactly what is happening inside of Iran. God is moving powerfully in Iran. The church leader also shared that they believe that the Ayatollah Khomeini is the best evangelist for Jesus. The the Ayatollahs brought the true face of Islam to light in that country. People discovered the lie. After 40 years under Islamic law, a utopia, according to them, they've had the worst devastation in their 5,000-year history of Iran, the leader said. And people are giving it up and converting to Jesus. Uh, Let me read a few things for us here. I'm going to share these, and then I'm going to come back. Let's get these slides going. What this guy says as he finishes up the article, he says, the seismic shift that's happened in the church of Iran is when all of these church planters, they found out something. He said, we found out that converts run away from persecution, but disciples would die for the Lord in persecution. That made me pause and think for a second about some slides that we could talk. I want you to just sit. You got to decide today, are you a convert or are you a disciple? And so let's go through that a little bit. A convert, if we just use Wikipedia, if we just use dictionary, means a convert means to bring over from one belief to another. Not a lot of life change there, just a belief. You can believe and and not have a lot of life change as you transfer beliefs. That's a convert. But the disciple, it's not just a belief, it's a bigger word, convinced. Call that a power word. Convinced of a school of thought, convinced of an individual, and therefore it creates incredible life change in their life. So here's some comparisons. Number one, disciples would die for the Lord in persecution. 
converts run away from persecution. Secondly, disciples forsake the world and they cling to Jesus. Converts are friends of the world. You may think of a Bible passage that says something about being friends of the world. If you're a friend of the world, you are an enemy of the Lord. Interesting. Disciples forsake the world and cling to Christ. Converts are friends of the world. And, and we, I could have so many pause buttons that we pause and be a whole nother 15-minute discussion. Don't forget that Jesus says, use the things of the world to gain an advantage. Be as sly as a snake and as innocent as a dove. So be careful. Doing those things, being sly and strategic with worldly things is not the same as being a friend of the world. You got to start thinking about what does it mean to be a friend of the world? What does it mean to be a friend of the Lord? You and I, we do a lot for our true friends. A lot of give and take and love and hard work and support and encouraging. So are you a friend of the world or are you a friend of the Lord? You got to compare those. It depends on if you're a disciple or if you're a convert. Number three, disciples obey and share the Word of God in any instance they get. Converts don't share the Word of God. Converts tend to be people when, when it's discovered you believe. They're like, I didn't know. The people around you go, I didn't know you were a Christian. That's not a compliment to us. That means we're a convert. And it means we're not representing Christ well. And I think in our culture today, because of just, I don't know, there's just so much weird out there under the name of Jesus. Christians are afraid sometimes to represent Jesus for fear of being linked with weird Christians. It's not normal people. We don't even talk normal. We use words that unchurched people can't even begin it. Jesus talked so simple. He was never churchy. He just so related to the unchurched world way better than he did to the church world. And I think because of that, we tend to, so many people tend to not want to be lumped in with Christians. And I say, I pray that you would conquer that and that you would represent the true Christianity and its strength and its championship status with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, everything about you, and that we claim back what it means to be a Christian and that we represent it well and people would be inspired by it. Disciples obey and share the Word of God. Converts don't share the Word of God. Number four, disciples Choose Jesus over everything. He is the center priority of everything in their life. Converts love Jesus as their co-pilot. Have you seen the bumper sticker? Jesus is my co-pilot. I'm sure the preacher in me wants to roll down my window every time and say, hey, hold on, hold on. change seats. <laughs> He's not our co-pilot. The co-pilot is never the boss. He's our driver. He's our king. He's our champion. Converts love Jesus as their co-pilot. Number five, disciples, they run to the fire to go fight it. First responders in all issues, willing to lay down their lives so that others could live because we're not worried about death. We're not worried about the afterlife. We know that when the afterlife begins, eternity is forever, and we live forever without death, without temptation. Death should be a celebration for the Christian, for the follower of Jesus, for the disciple, for sure. Converts run from the fire, crying for help. So I want to talk just a little bit personally amongst us. Uh, what, for Christ Church of Fountain Hills, the MO of being disciples couple things I want us to be aware of. Maybe this is like a state of the church address just a little bit. And overall, things are really good, but I just want us to be aware of a few things. These are, and I'll work in some announcements in here. Uh, how do you know you're a disciple of Jesus through Christ Church of Fountain Hills or for any church for that matter? I would challenge every single one of us without getting butt hurt about this to check your calendars and to check your bank accounts. Those two measurements measure where our heart and focus is. Every single one of us should be fully devoted to Jesus and be looking at worst case scenario. Why would we do that if we're champions? I, I, when, I, when, I, when Riley and Garrett's football team, undefeated season state champs, not a single kid on that team ever asked, 
what's the least we can get away with? Man, it was a fun year of full devotion, hard work like we never seen before. Just fun. So when it comes to your time, how much is devoted to the Lord? In church attendance, life group stuff. Uh, when, it comes to, when it comes to the Lord, would your bank account say, Lord, you are a major priority in my life? I'm looking at your scriptures and I'm doing what you ask and I'm going to grow it, Lord. I'm going to give beyond what you ask. Those are things that we're called to do as followers of Jesus. Uh, we don't have a giving problem in our church. I just think we have to address this on occasion and talk about what does it mean to be a disciple. I would encourage uh, what we've seen over the last three, three and a half years I've been here now is there's a group of people who is just part of a transition, and I, I don't like to keep bringing it up, but it's a reality of our history, is a, a group of people who were older. Uh, the average age when I got here was about 68. And just did the math and did some numbers, including all of our kids and our high school and everything, as I did when I first got here. It's 48 right now. It's fascinating. That's below the, the, the Fountain Hills, the demographic average in Fountain Hills is 55 right now. And that's, there's pros to that and there's cons to that. So we had an older generation that, for whatever reason, didn't decide to stay through the transition. And that means they took probably their number one thing with them, which was their ability to give. And in a stronger position to give than, say, a bunch of 30 and 40-year-olds with small kids, if you know what I mean. And so we've had those numbers replaced by younger families. And I want to challenge the younger families, which this means now I'm getting older if I'm calling you the younger families. I'm struggling with that internally a little bit, you know. Maybe I need to go get a tattoo, midlife crisis thing or something. Uh, I just want to challenge you, young families. You come into Christ Church of Fountain Hills, look at your calendar, and I know they're booked because you got little kids. Look at your bank account. Are you committed to the Lord? Would you be considered a disciple, or are you simply considered a convert? A lot of people, they'll look at the coffee shop out there, and they'll look at the big screen back here, and they go, whoa, this church is loaded with money. I just want to remind us all, that was given by one family in our church. And that copy shop was given by one lady in our church. And so that was money way above and beyond outside what is our regular tithes and offerings. Don't be deceived that we're just growing money on trees behind the building, right? And I say this, we don't have a money problem. I just like to talk about it because it's important. Just remember this, Jesus talked more about money than he talked about love in the scriptures. It's important because he knows that's where our hearts are. And so I just want to encourage us all to be faithful givers. I want to encourage us all to be faithful servers. Are you a convert or are you a disciple through your action? Faithful servers, I want to challenge us all. I hope we're bombarded on October 26th, 7 a.m. Keith, you in here? Are we meeting down at the park, Golden Eagle? We're meeting at Golden Eagle Park at 7 a.m. until we're done. We have a Make a Difference Day. And the town of Fountain Hills gives Christ Church of Fountain Hills more responsibility than any other group. They know we show up in force. Right now, we got a pretty pathetic sign-up. And I'm calling you out. Let's work our butts off on that day. We've got to clean up some yards, do a little bit of work. Even if you're like, you're, you're, you're getting older and you don't move as well, show up and just hand, hand those who are working their tails off and have more ability physically, give them bottles of water, check on everybody, figure out what you can do. But would you sign up and say on October 26th, coming up quick, at 7 a.m., we'll be done before lunch if we show up in force. I want to do that just for the sheer purpose of when the town of Fountain Hills comes across needs, that they're like, who's the champion in town? Who's the group in town that are known as the difference makers, the servers, the sacrificers? And I pray they would call us and that we would rally the troops with one simple email. If that bothers you, if you're frustrated right now, I'm concerned you're a convert, and I love you enough to challenge you with that. Connection cards, use those right now to fill out. I want to serve it, make a difference day. I want to be in a life group. You got to be gathering with other Christians on a regular basis if you're a disciple. And you're like, I'm a disciple. I'm fully devoted to Jesus. I don't need other people in my life to grow me towards Christ. I get it. Trust me, I get it. People pull me away from Christ. They rarely lead me to. I can think of less than five people in my life who actually lead me and challenge me to Christ. Everybody else is like, 
That's part of being a fully devoted follower of Jesus. You don't go to a life group to be fed. You go to a life group to serve, to encourage others, to grow to your level. And you do it with humility because that's like Jesus. Every single one of us are called to be disciples. Every single one of us are called to be the priesthood of all believers, pastors, not just converts. And so the last thing, there's two big things, and I don't know if the Mexico one's too late or not. Ron, is it too late to sign up? I know you're in here. I can't find you right now. Is it too late to sign up for Mexico? If you're interested in going to Mexico, give me those exact dates. November yeah, November 8th, Keith Pavia, executive guy. November 8th, it's coming up. November 8th. I, I hate to put you on the spot like that because if you had asked me, I didn't know either. That's why I asked. Uh, Uh, that's coming up in November. You want to go to Mexico for a few days? Go build a house. Go be the hands and feet of Jesus. Get out of your convert comfortable zone, if you are. And then there's another one in January. I'm leading a group right now. We've got 26 people going to Uganda. We're going to go spend 10 days. Six of those days are on the ground. We're going to work our tails off painting that ginormous school facility. Uh, That costs $23.50, covers everything. What's a Mexico trip cost? $3.60. All right? Uh, converts go to Mexico. Disciples go to you. <laughs> I'm teasing you, Derner. Derner. Derner can dish it out. I'm just giving him some back. It's all good. He was an old hockey guy. He's tough. All right. Listen, and we're wrapping it up. Is that my last slide? Yeah. Listen to this last slide, and then I want to go through something. I want you to just sit back, take a deep breath. You'll still get out in time for your football game. Christianity is thriving around the world. I'm going to prove it here in a minute. I already did with just Iran. Christianity is thriving and forcefully advancing all around the world. Are you a convert or are you a disciple? Converts don't get to heaven. Straight up. I know God's patient. And I know God's nice, he's kind, he's good, he's not nice, let's be clear. But converts, listen, you don't just take your only son and put him on the cross and drain every drop of blood out of his body and take a massive beating to where Isaiah describes the crucifixion of the Messiah of Jesus. This is hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus actually gets to the cross. It says he's so badly beaten, he's not even recognizable as a person. Looks like a hump of meat laying down there. That's our Lord. That's our Savior. Converts will not be able to say to Jesus after he paid that immense of a price and gave us all a free ride. All we got to do is say, I'm in and become disciples and obey him to prove that we love him. Converts won't be able to say, hey, I I believe in you. But there was never a sacrifice. There was never just the phrases that we went and the differences between converts and disciples. Disciples enter heaven for eternity. When Jesus says, narrow is the road that leads to heaven, we better believe that. He says, few find it. Few, if we're just being literal, is one out of three. I don't know. Phew, I'm haunted by that phrase. I'm motivated by that phrase. I'm not terrified by it. I'm not scared of it. I'm motivated. When when you're running the hurdles and you're on the championship team or you're in the undefeated football team and the opponent comes out onto the field and you see the requirements, the coach lays out the game plan, you're not terrified. You're not scared. You're like, today's the day, baby. I can't wait to take somebody's head off on that field. I love my son, Riley. Garrett, he's more of a lover than a fighter. All you have to do is ask him. He's a quarterback, so he's always running from the mean guy. Riley was the linebacker. And if you couldn't identify in the pile, the the heap, which one was Riley because all the numbers were mashed together, you just had to look for for the shaking head. That's what he was doing to the guy he just took his head off, and I loved it. I loved that. Followers of Jesus, we are called to be disciples, not just converts. So real quick, last night, I highlighted a bunch of these. Let me just read some of this. Five minutes. In this post, growth is defined by reaching people and converting them. 
and an increase in church attendance is not by birth rate, not by immigration. This is a study done by Renewal Theology. It's 30 pages I printed out, read through it multiple times. Christianity is the fastest growing, I hate to even call it a religion. You've heard me, if if you're new in here, Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship with our Creator. Religion is man-made. Jesus hates religion. Religion is full of people who have converted. But a relationship with Christ is fully devoted disciples, learners, of everything Jesus asks, obedient followers to Him, and not a one of us are perfect in that. Christianity is the fastest growing religion in the world without even a close second, it says. This is periodically updated. This is brand new stuff. So uh, the growth of Christianity in countries around the world is remarkable considering that it's a crime in most countries to be a Christian, punishable by death in most countries around the world. Christians in Iran, for example, suffer terrible persecution, uh, and yet Muslims there are still converting to Christ rapidly. And some people are saying this. I've read stories. Some people think, I don't understand God. How, how is Christianity so expanding? It's illegal there. Well, it's, in some of the cases, it's not because people are knocking door to door and being uh, evangelists because they get their heads cut off there. There are stories of people who are Muslim who said one day they got a knock on the door. And the only way they could describe it is that it was an angel in the form of a person standing before them saying, you are to be home tomorrow at 3 p.m. You have a visitor coming and you need to be here. Gone. Next day at 3 p.m., knock on the door. This Muslim writes about it and talks about it. He says, it's Jesus telling him about himself. And he gives his life to Jesus and becomes a fully devoted follower of Christ. He's rejected by his family as death threats. He has to flee his country. Jesus just, I wish he'd show up on my door. I would love that. How many of you just wish God would just show up and tell you exactly what to do next? Wouldn't it just be awesome? Wouldn't it be easy? God just shows up and terrifies us. We think it's a ghost. He, you know, the scare, t- I love to scare people. You know, it's just an immaturity thing of mine. And it's always funny when it happens to someone else. But I'd love to be terrified by God and fall on my face almost passed out because of the presence of the angel of the Lord and he tell me exactly what I'm supposed to do today and tomorrow or the rest of my life. It doesn't work that way for most of us because we're told that Jesus said, those who believe and have not seen, there is even a greater reward. And so let's look at Africa. I'm just going to hit some numbers. Christianity Today reports the church has increased its numbers in Africa from 9 million in 1900 to 541 million today. It's a 51% increase. Asia. First church was in 1959 and had only 29 members. Today, more than 500,000 Christians are just in Nepal all by themselves. The report came October 27, 2017, Nepal criminalizes Christian conversion and, ev- and evangelism. A couple weeks ago, we had Marietta up here, right? You remember, for those of you who were here, we did an interview. She's been to Mongolia. Mongolia, in 1989, only four Christians ag- existed. Today, over 20,000 th- 20, Christians. That's a big jump from four. Marietta, part of Christ Church of Fountain Hills, has specifically impacted that. You want to talk about something that charges a pastor's heart and challenges me to get off my butt and get out there and do all that I can to be this amazing, dynamic champion of a Christ follower to where people can't stand it. They want to know what's different about me, and they want to give their lives to Christ. And on occasion, you face incredible persecution, usually from converts, though, not from unchurched people. Chinese police dynamite a Christian megachurch. January 12, 2018, parliamentary officers used explosives and heavy machinery to destroy the church, reflecting tensions between Christians and the Communist Party. Let me be clear. They did not destroy the church. They destroyed the garage where the church meets weekly. And I should have put the picture up here. You see this steeple and this giant building and a giant dust cloud being exploded because China just blew it up as they're challenging Christians and persecuting them. China is on course today to become the world's most Christian nation within 15 years of today. The number of Christians in communist China is growing so steadily that it, that it by 2030 could have more churchgoers than America. There's a huge population there. Makes sense. 
South Korea, 1884, first Protestant church was planted. In 1984, 30,000 churches today, over 60,000, no, not over 60,000 churches actually today. In 1884, there was just one. That's an incredible growth. East Asia, 1990, 22 million Christians. Today, over 300 million Christians. Growth rate of 83%. Amazing. South Sudan, that's just above Uganda where we do a lot of work. Incredible persecution and trouble going on in that country. Uh, 154 what, what is it? The majority religion, 22% in 1970 was Christian. Today, 65% have become followers of Christ in the middle of incredible atrocity. Here's some did you notices, and you guys didn't get to read all of this. Did you notice 11 countries on the top 20 list of countries growing around the world in Christianity? All of them are Muslim countries where you can die for becoming a follower of Jesus. Did you catch that not a single country from Europe, North America, or Latin America makes the top 20 list? We have become full of converts, not disciples. And it would do us all well to admit it if we are one and start making the change. Did you see that the highest growth rates are found among all major non-Christian religious groups? Hindus, non-religious, Buddhists, Muslims, ethno-religionists, Benin, South Sudan, those are the highest growth ones, people that are definitely defying Christianity, yet they're mostly converting or becoming disciples into it. Australia, uh, members of the Pentecostal church increased from nearly 220,000 in 06 to 238,000 in 2011, 260,500 last year alone. It's exploding in Australia. It has growth particularly amongst, in Australia, young people with the increase in the 0 to 14 giving their lives to Christ, and the other one was, uh, here it is, 15 to 24 and 25 to 34 age profiles recorded as the fastest growing in Australia. The church is young and alive in Australia. Championship status. Europe, in other words, traditional, uh, uh, let me just read this, I didn't highlight it correctly. Uh, What's happening in Europe, traditional Christianity, that would be Catholic, that would be Orthodox, lots of smoke and ashes, lots of religion, but very little personal relationship, is in major decline in Europe. But evangelical Christianity is growing like they've never seen before. Again, young, giving their lives to Christ, practical, relevant uh, disciples. A few more pages here. Hillsong is one of the critical factors that made an impact in Australia, if you're familiar with Hillsong uh, at all. Three new evangelical, evangelical churches open in France every month. In the last 60 years, the number of active members of churches has increased tenfold in France. In Spain, 12 churches open, Christian churches open every month. There are 3,910 registered churches in Spain. This last year, 141 churches opened their doors, nearly 12 churches every month in little Spain, all by itself. Uh, A lot more stats. I'm just giving you a few things here. There are more, North America, there are more churches with 5,000 people attending weekly in their services, mega churches they're called, than at any other time in world history. So much for those, and there must be a little sarcasm in this writer, so much for those who claim ad nauseum that faith is declining in our country. Churches are growing like crazy in America. The churches that are closing their doors in thousands of numbers are churches that quit producing fruit 50 years ago, 20 years ago. And they just began to circle the wagons and hang on to, if I can be sassy, their pipe organs. I just heard of a church in the Phoenix area. They spent a million dollars on their pipe organ. The church was running nearly 2,000 at the time. Today, it's only been less than a decade. They are running 200 people, and their pipe organ is broke down, and the cost to fix it is $110,000. They asked, I spoke to them, I said, what should we do? I said, you should take that pipe organ and try to sell it. We tried to sell it. Nobody will take it. Nobody wants it anymore. And I said, well, do this. Get somebody who's really good welding and a blowtorch. Cut the pipe organ out of your building and 
go put it out in the front in an incredible art structure and honor it as history and let it be a reminder that we must forever be culturally relevant and do all that we can to reach people who are far from Christ. Uh, I repeat, the church in America is exploding. The churches who have quit producing fruit and have become full of converts are dying by the thousands. And I think it's the best thing that can happen in an American society. South America, we're almost done. 550 million Christians exist today. Um, I don't have the comparison. Uh, th this might interest you if you don't know this. The preacher, David Yong Cho, he's a pastor in South Korea, and I didn't read their numbers. South Korea has a tremendous church growth, followers of Jesus in South Korea. David Yong Cho is the pastor of the largest church in the world. Any guesses on how many people attend there? Some of you know. If you know, don't, don't shout. 800,000 people attend his church every weekend. Imagine church. You can't meet in one location. You got to do it so different. 800,000 people. You want to talk dynamic and inspiring. And if that's like, oh, I wouldn't be a part of that, I'm afraid you might be a convert. If that doesn't, there are going to be a billion plus people in heaven. And if you don't like large crowds, you're going to hate heaven. Right? All right. I think that might be all. Chile, one last one. Just a little old Chile. In 1900, there were 50,000 churches in Latin America, 50,000 Christians in Latin America. In the 1980s, that has grown to 50 million. 50,000 to 50 million. By the year 2000, they reached 137 million. You're on a winning team. Don't believe the news. Don't believe anything you see or hear around the world, anything different. You are, if you are a follower of Jesus, you are a winning team. And if need be, I challenge you, if you're a convert, become a disciple. Start getting excited about being on the best team in the whole world, in the whole universe for all of eternity. We are the followers of the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the champion of champions. He conquered death and he conquered your sin. Please live it and be proud to be a child of the creator of the sun and the moon and stars. I love being on a winning team. I pray you do too. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you. Help us walk out of here and be holy. Be good and righteous. Be bold and continue to be winners who represent you in a championship kind of way. Thank you, Lord, for being a winner. How cool is all of this? We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good week, everybody. See you soon.